okay. <laughs> so you guys, I totally already made a mistake, um, <laughs> which is that I set this up as a live stream in advance so I could share the link. But the problem was I set it up as a webcam, but then I can't use my PowerPoint. So that's a problem. Um, and hopefully, well, you know, here you are. So hopefully you're here <laughs> and hopefully everything's fine. Now I have a little special news for you tonight, which is that, um, is, which is that Mr. Van Star is at a church responsibility. And so we have the Van Spawn here operating the chat. So you guys know Jonathan. Jonathan, you wanna like lean over here and say hi so they can see you. Jonathan's yeah. here and uh, he, there yeah, he is yeah. in all his bearded glory. And um, he is here and Sir Ignis is here, yes. of course. So super excited for everyone. Um, and so excited to hear what you have to say about this book. So shall we jump in? Okay, so. Alright, so this book is semi-autobiographical. I don't know if you... Oh, Dracon noticed that you have a new shirt on that they haven't seen before. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't know how many of you realize that this book is semi-autobiographical, meaning that it is based loosely on the author's actual life. So, I'm kind of curious. Do you usually like... Oops, not ready to move forward yet. I'm not, um, do you guys usually like autobiographical type stories um, or do you find them self-serving? Uh, what, what do you like? So let me know. Oh, you're getting a lot of highs, Van Spawn. Um, so let me know what you think about biography or autobiographies. So the difference between a biography and autobiography, biography, someone wrote it about you, autobiography, you wrote it about yourself. Kind of curious. Um, he is number two. Jonathan is number two of the kids. So, um, yeah, there we go. Um, curious about that. All right. Because, because I am, I think people have different styles and they like it or not. So I'm curious about whether this is a style that you normally like. And I'm also curious about how many times I can say the word curious. So thank you stars. Let us shout out to the people from last class and you guys, I reread this chat three times because you were so fun. I had so much trouble choosing things to put in because I could have gone on all night. We could have done a whole hour just revisiting the chat from last class. You guys love Most Dangerous Game and you sure got it. So Strudel Kitty says, the Most Dangerous Game is definitely, I have decided, a very nice relief from Flowers for Algernon. And I would say that almost everyone agreed with Strudel Kitty. Um, everyone was ready to say goodbye to Flowers for Algernon. So tons of hating on Flowers for Algernon. Ooh, I'm looking at this feedback on your autobiogra autobiography preferences and you've got some interesting stuff about that. Um, kind of cool. All right. Um, then uh, we had Mark said to Jay Sand, I could attend this class pretty much every day. So then Mark C was like my favorite for an, a whole hour, um, which was awesome. And then Red Sager said that Most Dangerous Game reminded him of Lord of the Flies. And I thought that was a very good comparison. I had asked you if it reminded you of like Sound of Thunder and he pulls out Lord of the Flies, which I thought was a really interesting um, comparison. Then Simon said, and I haven't seen Simon. Is Simon in here tonight yet? I haven't seen him. Sometimes he has a school conflict. Um, Simon said, if you read anything with a teacher, especially Mrs. Van Star, then you will definitely understand it better and see more connections. And of course, that was a lovely shout out, Simon. Thank you so much. But I do think that that's the role of the teacher, right? The role of the teacher is to help you love something. And my teaching motto, I actually stole shamelessly from a poet. And it says, what we have loved, others will love, and we will show them how. And I think that's what teaching is, right? And I think he, he captured that, right? So, um, it's not necessarily hate. Strudel Kitty is clarifying. I didn't hate Flowers for Algernon. There's a lot of mental energy, right? Yeah. Okay, so um, you guys called me out on my magic eight ball mischief. And Deb Cody was like, oh, there were a bunch of them. But then Deb Cody Michael is like, that's so cheating. And Eliza says, shh, we saw nothing. But <laughs> you didn't like my, my uh, manipulation when I didn't get the answer I wanted in <laughs> magic eight ball. All right, so 
you know, do you see my light doing that thing? I had this problem last time. Um, and Jonathan, you might want to yeah. wear headphones. Yeah, Dad just, see, it's so weird. It's like thing. flickering. It's like sometimes it's, isn't that weird? I don't know what's doing that. The fan. The fan on my computer? See, he's a software engineer. No, no, the fan in the ceiling is changing the background lighting. Oh, really? Slightly. Turn it off then. Enough. He thinks it's a ceiling fan. We'll see. All right, so I loved this exchange. I loved this exchange. Strudel Kitty said, do you guys think that the general intended to hunt Rainsford or genuinely intended to hunt with him? It seems to me, no, not the light. Don't turn off the light. Sorry, turn off you, the fan. <laughs> Let's see, I um, don't know which one's which necessarily. It's been a while and y'all changed them all. Okay, the one on the left is the fan. So, he, Strudel Kitty says, Do you guys think that the general intended to hunt Rainsford or genuinely intended to hunt with him? It seems to me that his mood changes when Rainsford refuses. And Eliza Black Jarwear 2020, who, by the way, is coming to my house next Friday because she normally lives out of the country, but she has family that they're visiting who live like in the next town. And she's going to come here, which is crazy. If any of you were ever in North Texas, you're welcome. So she says, I'm pretty sure his intention was to hunt him because he wanted more intelligent game. And I just live for this. Like, I live for this. When I see this in the chat where you guys are talking to each other, it's like so awesome. Like, it, it is so cool for me as a teacher to see you guys asking questions and responding to each other where your insight is so powerful that I'm just like sitting there enjoying it. And that, that was beautiful. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I'm looking at you guys saying like some of you stopped at chapter five. It was a hard thing to do. Eliza Black Jaguar again, smart isn't wise. Mic drop that to me, like, and a number of you, a number of you commented back to her. I noticed uh, like Deb Coney had a one back and um a couple of you commented back like everybody got on board with with what eliza had said and then um natasha says basically you were saying he was a savage alarm bells go off right and it, i just thought that was true right like he's saying oh he's a savage and what should i learn from that right uh, if any of you are watching now and this is your first time in the class then i want to say a big huge welcome you're so welcome jump right in Everybody in the chat is super nice and um, they'll welcome you. And if you didn't get a chance to read Most Dangerous Game, we read the short story, not the novel, and we watched that last class. So you can go back and watch that. So Strudel Kitty says, the concept of taking the head of a creature that killed you, because this is when I asked, like, why do you think he kept the head of the thing that almost killed him? Um, Strudel Kitty said, the concept of taking the head of a creature that killed you is interesting, as well as human nature to want revenge or to see you overcome your or to see that you overcame your enemy you know what should we turn off this light we're, we're still working with the light trying to make it better do you think it could be my ring light i'm trying to see if it's still flickering i think i see it flickering it is flickering yeah okay. let's try to we'll we'll mm, quite a bit darker but we'll see no, no, it's, it's a background i don't know we're looking we're trying we're very techy around here all right so um then Clawfall says, well, that was the biggest challenge. So the head was the biggest trophy. And then I like I liked what Mark C. had to say about it, too, which is he kept the head to say, you may have injured me, but I injured and killed you. <laughs> right. So like I won. Um, so I thought your inner your exchanges about that were really interesting. And then Strudel Kitty said villains have no boundaries, which I thought was an excellent riff off of Mark C.'s villains have the best backstories. And I was thinking that maybe the Van Stars need to write like the book of villainy. And then Simon says, I only kill the worst and then names everyone on earth. Right. When when he says that, when the, when he's like, oh, yes, um, I only kill the worst people. And then he lists like every single type of person. It was so crazy. And then we had oh, some of these are so so good. Um, we had Deb Coatney. Oh, this is when I was asking you guys to do alliteration. And this was funny. Like this went on for days. There was alliteration for days. So Deb Coney, her eyes eked exactly Dracon Warrior. Oh, it used to be Warrior. What happened, Dracon? You changed your name. As she ran through the jungle, her legs lilted limbly. I couldn't even say it. And then Tony Breen, whose name I didn't recognize, with gown glittered glowingly, loved it. Um, and I, I thought that was great. And then William, as she ran through the jungle, her machete flushed fearsomely. That was nice. Jason, as she ran through the jungle, her heart hammered hazardly. Very, very nice. Very nice. Um, and then what are you thinking about the light? I think you can turn it on. Okay. I just want to check. 
I just want to check because the fan now has completely stopped. Okay. So we'll see. We're going to try this light back again. Oh, wait. I, I'm seeing the thing switch. And Hello. All right. So that was your alliteration. So that was awesome. Um, and then Eliza back Jaguar. He's like, oh, this dude I killed last night was so boring. Anyways, want a drink? And I just thought that was so funny. Like, the tone of it was so funny. It, oh, Dracon. Okay, you changed your name. All right. Well, I won't call you Warrior anymore. All right. Um, and then Natasha Romanoff. It is so nonchalant. It is, it's a great villainy, right? So, again, the Van Star book of villainy. All right. So, then I asked you guys to pick the theme that you thought the story was. And by a pretty wide margin, y'all picked D. Um, and so... The, the, the theme of the story, the most applicable theme of the story is that we're all less civilized. Light. It's definitely what's flickering it. Sorry it for the interruption. There we go. He says, jury is in. He thinks it's my ring light. So what's weird, though, is I recorded earlier today, and I did, I did not have this problem. All right. So um, and then um, Eliza sent me this. This was the favorite quote of mine of the night when I kept saying, these books are so dark, let's read them. And so she made this meme and sent it to me, which I thought was funny. So I don't know if, um, if any of you could make a super dark meme about this, but I would be open to that. All right, so here we are, ready to jump into A Day No Pigs Would Die, which, true story, I read this book out loud to my 11th graders. And the very last day when I was reading the very last line of the story, no spoiler, but I was reading the last line of the story and I started sobbing and I, I was like, so I felt bad because I could barely choke out the words. And when I looked up, all my 11th graders were crying too. And we were just all crying. It was very sad. All right. But so far, the book's not sad so far, but I guess that is kind of a spoiler. Guess what, guys? It's going to get sad. <laughs> okay, so, so far, chapters one through five. What do you think? Scale of one to five. Let the wild decimals begin. All right, let me see you. A one means, I cannot believe you're making me read this book. I hate it so bad. And then a five means, I really like this so much. Oh, Strudel Kitty, I'm probably going to cry. Not today, but the last one, probably. Elizabeth Woodward with a 3.7, Ethan with a 2.5. Not so much yet, huh? Well, you know what? I think this is one of those books that is, um, I think you're going to like it better as it goes on. Um, okay, Deb Cotney, Michael says four, but only because I'm, I'm, because I'm kind of exhausted of reading books about rustic farming tween boys, like Where the Red Fern Grows. Yeah, there are a lot in that genre, Michael, right? What are the other ones? We've got Where the Red Fern Grows. In some ways, I think this reads similarly to My Side of the Mountain, which we read. Um, and then we also have, um, there's another one, like Old Yeller is kind of similar, kind of same thing. Um, 4.5. Rustic Farming, <laughs> Dracon rates it as pie, which is awesome. Um, oh, Sayuri. So am I saying that right? Sayuri, so Sayuri, so Sabu. Um, a two. Oh, my goodness. I have, to, um, I have to persuade you. Nancy, thank you, Nancy. Nancy gave it a five. Y'all, Nancy is a good friend of mine in real life, and I, it makes me so happy when she gets to come to class. Um, okay, so we'll see this coming in. Can't decide where you like the dialogue style. Yeah, there is a lot of dialect. Do, well, do you mean dialogue style or the dialect? We'll be we'll be talking about that a little bit. Yeah, Deb Cutney, Old Yeller. All right, so you ready to dive in? Let's go, let's go. Blah, here we go. So exciting. All right, so in the first five chapters, these are the key events I think there are. I think that you've got the cow, right? That he runs into Apron and she's struggling to give birth to a calf and then he ends up being able to help her and then that that she repays his kindness by practically biting his arm off and then um he gets pinky the pig he gets pinky the pig pinky the pig is in the house um he gets pinky the pig and then they he and his dad make that home oh wait it no, it wasn't 4.31 that I referred to as pie. There was a 3.15. You might not have seen it because uh, the YouTube held it for review because I think because it had so many decimals. Oh. Um, okay, so it's fine. Um, so this is Pinky the Pig. 
And then they make a home for the pig with that corn crib. We're going to talk about that. And then he goes on that walk, and they had that experience with a frog. And then there's this whole thing about Vermont. All right, so that's what I think happens so far. Okay, Kira's saying it is the dialect because it's difficult to understand. You know, you know what? I looked up like some of the common vocabulary words that you should explain to students before they read this book. And there were so many that I decided not to explain any of them because they're so unusual that you're not really going to see them again because of the dialect. Some of the words in the book are so archaic that you can't even find the true meaning of it. In any event, okay, so what are, uh, I, those are the main events I think of, but what should I have added? I want you to choose one. So let me, let me show you again. This is what I say are the key events. The cow with the calf in the bite, and the, like, Siri, the taking off the pants is part of that, right? Um, oh, Mark, thank you for the gasp for my pig puppet. I'm very excited about it. Um, so, um, Deb Coney, uh, saying the coming of a genre is super overused and worn out. There is a very cool term for it though. Let me type it in the chat. The term for that kind of book um, is, even even in English, we use the German word for it, which is Bildungsroman, um, which is, Roman is a novel. And so it's like a building novel and that we call it a Bildungsroman. So if you want it to sound really erudite or learned, you can just tell your teacher, I'm just not a fan of the Bildungsroman. And then she won't probably even, or he won't even know what it means, likely. So, and then you'll feel like, see, I don't like it. So I think that taking off his pants is part of the cow thing. But these are the four things I think happen. If you were going to add one, what would you add? So here are your choices. Vote. I want you to vote. Choose one. Should I add that he was teased at school and leaves school? Because I think you could argue that that's the inciting incident of the novel. And then... Um, adding in the stitches in the arm, that was pretty impactful. And maybe not an event, but rather the influence of the Shaker religion. So there we go. Um, okay, I'm looking at Elizabeth's comment. Well, I'm waiting for the answers to this to come in. I'm looking at Elizabeth's comment. I read this with an audiobook, which I think actually kind of helped my understanding of phrases I'm not used to. So true. That is a really good, um, that's a good insight, Elizabeth, and that is true. Okay, so Dracon says... Um, oh, okay, so Siri so says school and the struggles there. Yeah, you know what? That's a good point. That probably should have been added because it comes up again. Um, and then Dracon, um, yeah, tees at school and leaves. Okay. Um, Mark C would add the shakers. Shakers. But then Dimple Shaw says tees at school. Jennifer Cheatham says the shakers. You think the cow arriving is the inciting incident. I can see why you would say that, Strudel Kitty, yet I'm still going to stick with school because if he hadn't left school, then the cow would have just been out there in the field without him. Um, and Jay Sand won't vote. She said one or three. Something about the Shakers, but if you want an event. Okay, interesting. Nice. All right. Um, so let's start with the forward. Let's start with the forward. So this one actually had five chapters and the forward. So what is a forward? Um, a foreword, so there's a lot of kinds of things in books that you get that are called front matter. They're all called front matter. I feel like I sounded like Moira Rose when I said matter. Um, there are a lot of things that can go in the front of a book that we call front matter. And these are things like an introduction, a preface, stuff like that. And a foreword is one of those things. And so what does a forward do? So a forward will often give the book's backstory, like justifying why the book was written or why the author is particularly qualified to write this book. Sometimes the forward will give thanks, um, and you should be thankful if you can spell it correctly, because I think forward is one of the most frequently misspelled words, because people spell it with an A, right? F-O-R-E-W-A-R-D, forward, or without the E, and then the A, like F-O-R-W-A-R-D. So it gets spelled incorrectly. When we're talking about a foreword in a book, it is spelled like this. The for word, like the word that came before. All right. And then the interesting, interesting, the foreword is always signed. See how it's signed by the author. The foreword is always signed. And the preface is not. Prefaces are typically not signed or prologues not signed. In nonfiction, a foreword is typically not written by the author. Usually the four would be written by someone else. 
Mark asks, did I see that the foreword wasn't original to the book? No, I didn't even notice that. It does say, I'm looking at that. How did you know that? It's not in my little thing. It, it doesn't have a date on it. What, Mark, while you are telling me that, <laughs> Mark just read, um, the, oh, Deb Coatney, cool, forward, a hospital ward before the other wards. Very nice, very nice. Okay, um, Mark C., um, irony that you just misspelled it, but tell me how you know that it was written later. One thing interesting about this book, this book was published in the early 70s, and it is one of the very first novels that was considered young adult fiction. So it was really kind of groundbreaking at the time. All right, so first lines, on a farm. Here's where my boyhood began. I think it's just such an interesting start because it's so choppy. I mean, who starts a book with a prepositional phrase? Like, it's an incomplete sentence. It's a fragment. It's just this prepositional phrase, on a farm. Here's where my boyhood began. I just think that is interesting. When an author makes a style choice like that, it's really worth looking at. It's really worth looking at to see, like, okay, look at the copyright. The foreword was different. Hmm. My... Copyright renewed 2000, forward copyright 2005. You're right. So I wonder, it would be interesting to go find an old copy of the book. I don't have my old copy from when I was a kid, but it'd be interesting to find an old copy and see if there was a forward and he changed it or if there was no forward and he added it in. Ooh, that's really kind of interesting. Um, okay, Michael Archer saying, I think it could be all of them, what things you should add what things I should add, because if he hadn't been a shaker, he wouldn't have been able to help Apron, thus allowing him to get pinky. I don't know if it, if he weren't a shaker, because I think they were all farmers, but I see your point, that they're all connected. Yeah. All right, so then he says this, a boy must learn a farmer's mission, and I put a box around mission, because we're going to see that again. Um, how to turn grass into milk and field corn into hogs, how to aid birth, how to slaughter, milking at five and five. And this just struck me, that... The, the kind of chanty, sings almost, almost poetic language here, how to turn grass into milk and field corn into hogs, how to aid birth, how to slaughter, milking at five and five. And when I read this, I thought of this. I thought of the verses in Ecclesiastes. So let me give a shout out to the Bible here. From a literary standpoint, does not matter if you are religious at all, it does not matter if you're an atheist or you are of another faith. You really should know at least the basic framework of the Bible and important stories because there's so much allusion to it. And and the Bible as literature is really important. So anyway, in the book of Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament, there's this very famous chapter where it said, you know, to everything there is a season and a time of purpose under heaven. And they've even turned it into this old song that some of you may have heard called Turn, Turn, Turn. And uh, so you can go Google it, play, have Amazon Music play it for you. But in it, it says a, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to till, and a time to reap, like a time to, like all of these things. And this just made me think of that, that idea that, that there's this, you know, a time, a time to sow and a time to reap, a time to milk the hogs, a time to raise, a, a time to slaughter. And it just felt like this. I don't know if any of you um, know. And Jay Sand, Jay Sand says, I'm seeing this in the chat. For some reason, when I read the line, how to slaughter, my heart dropped and I read it in like a really like eerie way. Okay, but guess what, Jay Sand? That's foreshadowing, right? When you see that and you get that feeling, that tells me you're a strong reader because you're picking up on that it is foreshadowing. And yes, Deb Coatney, literally every Western author of note refers to the Bible, even Eastern authors, even Eastern authors, because some of the stories are fairly universal. All right. So, um, all right, let's keep going. All right. So I decided at the risk of um, Michael's wrath uh, to look closely at juxtaposition in the chapters that we're looking at tonight. So what is juxtaposition? Juxtaposition is, I guess I won't advance yet, juxtaposition is when we put two things next to each other that are different in order to highlight the differences. It enables us to compare and contrast more clearly because they are so disparate. So juxtaposition is not putting a pig next to a hog. Juxtaposition is putting an elephant next to a guinea pig, right? So juxtaposition here. And so I really wanna look at that. 
All right, so let's see. Do I have more novels set up or is it open for suggestion? I think Challenger Deep by Neil Schusterman. All right, y'all, um, we'll look at that. Is it long? Ethan, tell me if that novel is long because there was a, a lot of requests last time for a longer novel. So let me know. Oh, and Michael says, no, don't do that. All right, well, we'll have to vote. Challenger Deep is about 300 pages. Okay, oh, Jonathan just said 300 pages. Did you like it? Let's ask the Vans I haven't one. read it. I oh, you haven't read it? it. Oh, he just looked it up. He's so quick. Um, all right, so associated words with juxtaposition. Other literary terms that you'll see that are kind of similar. Foil. Foil is usually character. So like a lot of times you will have a character next to it. So in, if any of you have read Romeo and Juliet, like Mercutio and Tybalt are like foils for each other and foils for Romeo. So a foil is a character who highlights a trait of another character. So like you'll have, sometimes you'll have like a, a comic character and then a serious character. Um, woo, a bunch of people don't like that book. It's not, Ethan says it's not that long, but some people say they do not like that book. Okay, that's interesting. We, we do need to find another book. I thought I had planned out the books, though. I feel like I have a plan through summer. Um, okay, and then paradox. You'll see paradox as well. Paradox is where something seems like it can't possibly be true, and yet it is true. You also will see oxymoron. The word juxtaposition comes from the Latin word that means joust and um, which comes from a word meaning to join. And so juxtaposition is like these two things kind of fighting each other and able to compare and contrast. So um, in, in Harry Potter, you get juxtaposition when the muggle world and the wizard world butt up against each other, butt up against each other. So you get that. I'm trying to look at the thing. Um, yes. But, but Deb Coatney, Michael, justice was never meant to be the theme through which, the lens through which we would read everything. <laughs> I changed the lens that we look through everything. So it's not exactly juxtaposition that we're going to look at. What we are going to look at, though, are the contradictions and the way that the author is constantly contradicting and how that is a metaphor for life, like how we're always contradicting, like always good things. So um, there we go. Ooh, a bunch of people... We're, we're going to have to talk more about books. So this is the image that we're going to use where, like the sun shower, right? Where it's like sunny and rainy at the same time. All right. So let's jump in to chat, um, this beautiful imagery. There's so much figurative language in here. It's kind of weird because we've got this like really, really redneck dialect, but then there's very sophisticated figurative language. Did you guys notice that? All right, then um, he says, five acres of Vermont became a Sahara of raw responsibility. All right, so first official question of the night, how is this metaphor possibly true? And um, what is he saying about a farm here? Let's look at it again so you can give me this. Five acres of Vermont, so that tells us how big their farm is, became a Sahara of raw responsibility. How is this metaphor true? How, how is a farm like a desert? Typically, when we use a metaphor to compare things, we are saying these things aren't, these things are similar in some important way. And so what about, what about this? Like how, how is this farm like a desert? Are we doing it? Like, are we buying it? And in what way is it true? All right, so stop talking about what book you wanna read and answer my question. Um, I wanna know what you think about this metaphor because I, I struggle with it, to be honest. So let me show it to you again, and I wanna hear. How is the farm a Sahara? What does he mean by that? What is he talking about? What is he trying to tell us about the farm? All right, then he says, oops, then he says, I made a simple man's decision, this is still the foreword, to write, to sing memories of a farm, parents, and a pet pig, one by each, which is interesting, because normally we say one by one, one by each, I lost them all, yet recollection embraces them forever. So, okay, I'm looking at this. The Sahara is massive. Okay, farm seems drowning in responsibility, but drowning doesn't really s strike me for a desert. Super dry, I don't know, woeful amount of responsibility. Super exhausting, maybe. Super desolate, hard to cross. Okay, giant desert of unknowns and challenges. Okay, suffocating, dry responsibility, nice. Constantly changing. Sahara is huge, huge responsibility, nice like it. Thank you guys. Yeah. I mean, uh, there's no right or wrong, right? And I like your insights. Thank you for sharing them. I think that 
I like the way that you're thinking deeply about it and not just saying, I don't know. Okay. So curious, look at, look at these lines. I made a simple man's decision to write, to sing memories of a farm, parents and a pet pig one by one. I lost them all yet recollection embar embraces them forever. So what tone is the author trying to create here? So let me go back to it and show you the question you're answering is what tone is being created here. And whenever like tone is a fancy English teacher word, but basically what it means is what is the author wanting you to feel like what kind of mood Well, tone and mood are different, but what is the tone? Like how, what is, what is his attitude toward this story? Like, is he excited about telling it? Is he like, what, what tone is he creating here? All right. And he says, A Day No Pigs Would Die was written to honor all folks who do hard work and make harder choices. So it's very rare for authors to tell you their intent. So pay attention whenever they do that. So whenever an author says, this is why I wrote this book, you should pay attention because authors don't usually do that. They make you like fight for it and argue about it with your English teacher. And so that's rare. But also we're going to forgive that little weird comma placement. Notice that comma placement there, hard work and make harder choices. Like that isn't two independent clauses. I don't know what's going on there. Um, but sometimes we'll put in a comment in order to cause a pause in the reader. But I read this over and over and I couldn't make that comma make sense. I really wanted to like send him an email and ask him like, dude, what's going on with that Tom comma? All right. Sentimental, reflective, a tone of tragedy. He wants you to know it's not a happy go lucky story. Um, reflective. I like that idea. Reflective, melancholy. Yeah. I think I, I, I think, yeah, that's that's good. Sad and dystopian. Oh, Dracon says I wouldn't have picked the book if it wasn't dark. Ah, you know me. Okay. All right, so let's meet Vermont because the setting here is super important to the story. Setting is super important. I don't know why I keep waving the book around. I can put it down. Uh, the setting is super important, so let's meet Vermont. Vermont is an interesting state. So here's Vermont way up here and um, just like northeast of New York shares a large border with New York and just north of Massachusetts and just west of New Hampshire. And Vermont and New Hampshire are almost like the inversion of each other. Um, okay, Michael Archer, I like this. The Sahara is such an awful place to build anything. So it would have made a great comparison to rural Vermont. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Nice. Okay, Mark C with our first hashtag of the night, irrational commas. All right. Um, yeah, Ethan says, brainstorm the darkest book you could think of, right? The darkest book I have ever read, really, probably, is The Stranger by Albert Camus. All of those existentialists are just so dark, but I don't like to read them because you need, like, a Prozac salt lake. All right, so here are some fun facts about Vermont. It is the second least populous state. The only state that has fewer inhabitants than Vermont is Wyoming. There is no McDonald's in the state capital of Vermont, which is Montpelier, and it is the only state capital in the United States with no McDonald's. Vermont has the highest ratios of cows to people in the United States. It is called the Green Mountain State. And um, there were these Green Mountain boys in 1777 who tried to, they were like instrumental in the revolution and they get referred to quite a bit in the story. Um, it was the first state added to the original 13 colonies and so it is um, the 14th state. Sorry, I still have my like video kind of blocking a few words, but it's hard to guess what that's going to be. Under French rule, so Vermont was um, controlled by the French. Its name is from Vermont, which is Green Mountain. You get it. Green Mountain Boys. That's where it comes from. And it was under French rule until the French and Indian Wars in 1763. And it is 77% covered with trees. And interestingly, no billboards allowed. No billboards are allowed in the entire state of Vermont, uh, which is interesting. There, I looked it up and there are a couple of that. Um, let's see. Mrs. Van has a great class. I, I miss it. The chat went up. No McDonald's. I'm shook. Strudel Kitty's like, I can't go. I can't go. And Deb Cody, <laughs> you guys are so funny. All right, so here we go with our juxtaposition. It, and this is like this little poem, this like epitaph kind of thing as the book is starting. A farmer's heart is rabbit soft and farmer's eyes are blue, but farmer's eyes are eagle fierce and look a man right through. And that's this juxtaposition, this idea of, um, of the, like you can, you can seem kind, but then at the same time, 
you can be really vicious. So kind of interesting. All right, chapter one. I better speed this up, folks. We're halfway through and I'm just starting chapter one. This isn't boding well. All right, the dialect. And I think it was Kira who said the dialect is a little off-putting and it can be, right? But I thought it was kind of fun. Um, so should, should, should of been, I think it actually was should of been in school. And then the old spat mine, spat is iron. And then turn tail, we don't say that. Uh, this was my favorite. I'd kick him from one end of Vermont to the other and sorry him good. And I think that, I think that needs to be, is Cloudfall here? Yes, Cloudfall, please add that to the hashtags. Sorry him good. I like that. I want, I want that as a hashtag. Um, sorry him good. And then it says, the, and so then this is when, this is when he, um, this is when Rob finds Apron and Apron is struggling to birth the calf and it's really hard. He's trying all this stuff and he was going to give up, but he says the only, the only thing that made him get up and give the whole idea another go was when he bawled again, when he bawled again. And so here's my question for you. When the calf like cried and, and Rob realized the calf was alive and he decides to go again. Do you think that that was obligation? Meaning like, okay, this thing is alive. I can't just let it die. Or do you think it was hope? Like it, it gave him like the emotional energy to keep trying like incentive or something else. So weigh in. Oh, it's cookie cookie. That's right. I keep, I don't know what it is about the case. Cookie cookie. Are you here tonight? Is cookie cookie here tonight? I didn't see cookie cookie. Um, sorry, I'm good. Like learn him. Yes, there we go. Um, so is this obligation, hope, something else? Let me know what you think. All right, next. Um, now only three things could happen. My trousers would rip, apron would just uproot the tree, or the calf would slide out. So that was, I, I think he puts the thing he thinks is least likely at the end, right? He thinks the trousers are going to, his pants are going to rip, or the cow is going to pull the tree out. These cows weigh a lot. And so these are big cows. And then he finally is like, oh, you know, or maybe this will work, right? Maybe this will work. And then he says, I beat her so hard I was crying. Why do you think, why do you think, why do you think he was crying? Like, have you ever had an experience like that? Like you're having to do something that's hurting something else and it upsets you? Yeah. Everybody's like, where's Cookie Cookie? Cookie Cookie. <laughs> um, Compassion. Okay, Jennifer's saying compassion. Interesting. Hard-willed. He's a farmer. He's not willing to give up because of one sat back. Yeah. Sad, cookie-less world. Oh, Drew, that's hysterical. We'll have to tell her that we missed her. All right, so then this juxtaposition again. Something either got dead or got born. And in his world, these two things are very close to each other, right? Close to each other. Um, yeah. Okay, so then he pulls a thing out of the cloud. I start reading you guys and I forget to teach. <laughs> okay, so is it what's in that cow's throat? So do you remember when he reaches in the cow's throat and he pulls this thing out? He thinks it's like an apple or something stuck in the throat. He pulls it out and then we find out later that it's a goiter. So what a goiter is, is it's a sign of iodine deficiency and it is a swelling in the thyroid and it can completely obstruct the throat and you can die. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah, he wants it to happen so bad he's willing to hurt her, but it still hurts him. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it's like sometimes like I've had when Jonathan, the van spawn over here, when he broke his arm. I can time? the second time you broke your arm. Oh, those German nurses the, were awful. Yeah, he had awful. We were in Germany. It was this really traumatic experience and it was really hard. But I had to make sure that his arm got set right. Like. This kid, he's the only one of my kids. No, your brother broke a collarbone twice. Setting it, setting it wasn't too bad. It's when they were taking the x-ray, they were just yanking. No, that was the out. first time. No, it was the second one where it was terrible. Okay. The first one might have hurt. I don't remember. <laughs> he was only three the first time he broke his arm. He doesn't remember, but I do. All right, so, um, okay, here we go. What's in that cow's throat? So what would you do? Would you reach your arm in that cow's throat? And then I thought to myself, what would Sam do? What would Sam Gribbly do? What would Sam do from My Side of the Mountain? If you haven't read Side, My Side of the Mountain, you should read My Side of the Mountain and watch the classes. But what would you do? Would you reach your hand in there? Yeah. Yes, Ethan, that's why salt is iodized. If you don't have enough iodine, iodine is an essential nutrient. And then he says, that somebody, so I really want to know. Go ahead. I'm going to move on, but I want you guys to tell me, what would you do? Would you reach your hand into that cow's throat? And what do you think Sam would do? 
if you read if you read my side of mountain all right so that somebody was wrong as sin on sunday another one of these great dialect choices this fabulous simile wrong as sin on sunday but then watch this alliteration and we just did alliteration in the last class but look at this it should have been broad daylight but it was night black night as black and as bloody and as bad as getting hurt again and again could ever be and even though again and again aren't part of the alliteration the again and again help your mind see this kind of um this kind of sing-songy chant that clues you into the alliteration y'all think sam would eat the cow yeah maybe he would feed the cow to his falcon that's so funny some of you Sam would probably pull the goiter out with surgical precision and then stitch himself up perfectly after being bitten. Doug Coney, I think, I think you're right. Okay, that's funny. All right, so chapter two. Hey, we can go through a chapter. Chapter two opens in what we call in media res, meaning in the middle of things. Chapter two opens, Haven Peck. They're just calling his name. Haven Peck. Someone was yelling out Papa's name. And because he, he is like named after his dad, but he goes by Rob, right? Okay, um, I'm looking to see, yeah, Sam would know what to do, right? Okay, so it starts in media rest. And then I think this is so ironic that he hears his dad say to the farmer who owns the cow, whose calf he just saved and the cow he just saved. And he hears him say, we're beholden to you, Benjamin Tanner, said Papa, for fetching him home. Whatever he done, I'll make it right. They just assume that he did something wrong. And doesn't this, like, when you're a kid and especially a teenager, is this not the story of your life where you do something good, but then everybody assumes that you're the bad guy and that, like, whatever happens, happen when I, when I was a teenager, when I was a teenager, my toilet stop working in the bathroom that I used like and it got higher and higher and higher but I didn't want to tell my mom and my stepdad because my stepdad was kind of mean and I was yeah I was scared to tell so I didn't tell until it like flooded over so then they couldn't clean it out like they couldn't get it clear so they had to call plumber and when the plumber came he extracted a whole chicken like a chicken that you would buy at the grocery store like a plucked whole chicken a whole chicken and a box of envelopes from that toilet and I was grounded for an entire month for flushing a chicken and a box of envelopes down the toilet and for my 30th birthday I asked my mother to admit that she knew that I had not flushed a chicken and a box of envelopes down the toilet how would you even flush a chicken down the toilet like how would I even do that I think it must have sucked up from the you know like the the drain or you know the sewer system or something anyway a chicken and so I just feel, I feel for Rob here. I mean, don't we all feel for Rob? Yes, I had a wicked stepdad. Well, yeah. Okay, so, yeah, he wasn't, he, he was like a lot older than my mother. And he wasn't really into raising a kid. So uh, he'd already raised his kids. But yes, it was so it's crazy. Current one, is it? No. Okay. Um, and I just feel so sympathetic to him because teenagers just all like, Everybody's always blaming you. And I was the only child. Are any of you only ch children? If you're only children, chicken in a toilet. Yes, Jaycon, that is, that has to be a hashtag now. Um, right, why would we do that? And we do feel for Rob. And so it's like, it's like so ironic. And I just hate that for him. All right, and then, he's, and then his dad says, I ought to lick you proper for leaving the schoolhouse. And it's like, Okay, but he the cow would have probably died and the calf would definitely have died, right? Um, okay, so how does how do you think like the father is so concerned about him going to school and I want I want you to tell me how you think the father's lack of education influences how does the father's lack of education influence his feelings about his son's education and does it ring true with you like his um, in his yes, you achieve enlightenment, but your teacher blames you for breaking the pencil sharpener. Yes, yes. Okay. Having a sibling can amplify it. Maybe you like blame each other. I don't know. But you have a nice sister, Deb Coatney, Michael, that makes you like clay trisket. No, cheese it. Um, so when you're an only child, there's nobody else to blame. Uh, no, his, his name is Robert Pick, but see, I think that, I think it's possible that his, that Haven Peck was his, um, oh, maybe, maybe they were saying, maybe they were like calling to him, like, Haven Peck, like calling him. 
I thought it was maybe that he went by Rob as a nickname. Oh, no. Interesting. That's kind of interesting. Thanks for bringing it up. Don't ever worry about bringing something up later. I can handle it. And then this, I love this line. This is my favorite. This is my favorite. I love the, I love some of the others too, but this is my favorite. And this was Serignus's favorite. Serignus says, I just love this one. It's enough to sell your soul. And he's going to start saying that, aren't you, Serignus? Serignus is now saying, it's enough to sell your soul. So if you haven't attended class before, then you need this. You need to know that this is our class mascot, Serignus the dragon, named um, by the class. So then he says, a boy with a whistle as fine as this won't have no earthy reason to skip school. You have a mind to agree. So here we have that dialect again. And I think it's like, um, I think this shows that juxtaposition again of this, like he's super upset about him leaving school. And at the same time, he makes him a whistle and, and it's like he's kind and stern simultaneously and then the boy rob says when you kill pigs for a living you can't always smell like sunday morning you just smell like hard work and i put this picture of like this idealized version of farm life and i i want to share with you um, i'm gonna i guess i'm gonna share it later i had something but it's this idealized version that we have of farm life but what he's saying is you know farming smells it smells it's hard work and it smells all right chapter three it smells worse than iowa it smells worse. Yes. Oh it's, my word. We used to live in Iowa and we know what it smells like. Uh, bad. Pigs smell bad. So we keep, and it, I mean, it's our fault. Like pigs in the wild probably don't smell bad, but those pigs do. They smell pretty bad too. They, they, okay. Um, so he says, we keep this fence up. This is Rob talking. We keep this fence up like it was war. I guess that humans are the only things on earth that take everything they own and fence it off. So this is what he says, but his dad has a different view. Did you notice this? I just thought this was so interesting. He says, he's talking about robins and he says like that a female robin will not be attracted to a male robin unless that male robin has a territory. And he says that whistle you hear is his fence. I thought that was so interesting. Um, and then the dad says, all living things put up a fence one way or another like a tree do with its roots. And I thought this was so interesting. Uh, what do you think? How do people put up emotional fences? Like, what does that look like? And where do you see other fences than the ones that they talked about? So they talked about people like building physical fences. They talked about um, the robins with their whistle. And they talked about um, the tree with its roots, like as kind of a fence. So I'm curious about how what other fences that you can think of like other things or other ways that we put up fences i just thought it was such a cool cool idea that every living thing puts up fences um i just thought of one i just saw our pet and thought of another way that animals put up a fence so and he says then it isn't like war and then he says it's a peaceable war so so rob says then it isn't like war and his dad says, it's a peaceable war. A fence sets men together, not apart. So interesting. Yeah, and Sayuri, Sayuri, you still have to tell me if I said your name wrong, if I missed the comment, I'm sorry. Um, and I, I wanna know, in what ways is this true? In what ways is this true? That a fence set men, sets men together and not apart. Um, oh, Elizabeth? Thinking of the um, poem that you read for class about walls and neighbors, I think that's a Robert Frost poem. Jonathan, you want to Google it real fast, see if you can find a Robert Frost poem about walls. Um, okay, fences divining mindsets. That's interesting. So do you think that there are any fences you could have that set you together with someone as opposed to apart? Um, I'm kind of curious about that. All right, so then we have this term, and it's so interesting that it's, in the time that we're looking at juxtaposition because oxymoron is kind of related to this. Um, so oxymoron is something where it's apparently contradictory. So we will say something like it was so, so hot, it was cold, like it was cold hot, right? Um, that's an oxymoron. It looks like it's contradictory, but somehow it still works. Um, so oxymoron, contradiction in terms. 
So Romeo and Juliet, few examples of it. Oh, brawling love. Oh, loving hate. Oh, heavy lightness. All of these oxymorons. How can you have fighting love, loving hate, heavy lightness? Oxymoron. Oxymoron. Okay, so here we go. Oh, Dracon says it was Robert Frost. Did you find it? There is a poem. I called, think it's called Mending Wall. There's a poem called Mending Wall. Oh, English teacher for the win! All right. And yep. Poem called Mending Wall. Da da da. I should be a teacher. Do you want for it or? No, it's fine. I just, I just wanted to be right. Okay, so here's your turn. I want you to think. I want you to think of a word, and the spaces are the letters. The spaces are the number of letters. Um. Oh, Michael, that's an interesting insight about the cell membrane. Yeah, fences, boundaries. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, okay, so jumbo what? That would be an oxymoron. I want you to make me an oxymoron. And there's a word that goes in here, six letters. Yep, six letters. What do you think goes in there? I'm going to move along here. Yeah, loud silence. Loud silence. That's an oxymoron. Very good. Very good. Um, okay, here we go. Jumbo blank. That would be an oxymoron. She's on a working blank. She's on a working blank. I'm a definite blank for the party. Five spaces. Oh, I should go back to this one. This is a longer word. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight letter word. She's on a working blank. That is an oxymoron. Oh yeah. Mrs. Van says Michael for Deb Cotney because I know that he's using his mom's account. Is that okay? I know there's a Michael Archer too. Should I say Deb Cotney? Tell me what you want me to say. I should be a teacher, is a teacher. I know, it's kind of silly, right? Okay, I'm a definite blank for the party. She's on a working, okay, yeah, working vacation is what I had. Will holiday fit? I don't think the letters are quite right, but vacation. But that would work too. Like if you're British, especially, you would say working holiday. Okay, their flight, their fight, F-I-G-H-T, their fight is an open blank. This one is a little trickier. One, two, three, four, five, six. See if you can get it. Jumbo dwarf, that's pretty good, but it was jumbo shrimp. And somebody got that one. Yeah, Jason. There were a couple of people who got jumbo shrimp. Yeah, okay. Um, and then they are, oh, did we get this one? Did we get this one? I'm a definite, I'm a definite blank for the party, five letters. And then last one, their fight is an open six letter word. Open six letter word. Just say Michael A for Michael Archer. All right, so nice job on these. Michael or Deb is fine. Okay. All right. I just, I know who you are. All right. So nice job. I love, I love seeing your answers. All right. You're guessing. You're I guessing. I don't believe they got. I don't think you got all of them. They though. didn't get. Oh, did you get this get one? They didn't get definite and they, I did. I, I'm not. I'm a definite I'm blank for the party. Um, I got that one too. But. I know. And then did you get this? Their fight is an open blank. I'll give you guys another minute or so to get it. And then I'll let the van spawn throw it in the chat. Cause I bet he figured it out. All right, so you did good. And, he, and so then the farmer gives him, Tanner gives him, here's a pig for your trouble. And that's probably the first time that sentence has ever been uttered in, in human existence. Here's a pig for your trouble. <laughs> Let me give you a gift. Um, no, not open peace, but good job. Their fight is a good open, remember it needs to be a contradiction. So yeah, all right, Jonathan, go ahead. Throw him in the chat. Jonathan's gonna go ahead. And then look at what he does here. She had a pink nose and pink ears, and there was even a whisper to of pink in the fork of her toes. So this repetition of pink is interesting, and then this rhyme of nose and toes, also interesting. So the father doesn't want to accept it until Tanner says that he wants help later, and this is a form of prepayment. What does that tell us about the father? What does that tell us about the father, that he doesn't want to accept the pig until the other guy says it? All right, she was mine, 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 mine. All right, and I want you to do this. Imagine that you're writing a short answer. Imagine that you're writing a short answer response for your teacher, and you are writing this line. In A Day No Pigs Would Die, Rob Peck says, she was mine, 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 when he has given the pig he names Pinky. His reaction shows that he blank. What does that reaction show about him? What does that reaction show? I want you to get you set. That is exactly how I would integrate a quote, right? We haven't done writing in a while, so there's a little writing thing. All right, so tell me what you think it says. Let me go back to there. His reaction shows that he what? All right, moving on. Can't keep swine and kind under the same roof. 
says so in the book of shakers so swine are pigs kine are cows says so in the book of shakers so i decided i better look up this book of shaker thing because i kind of knew what shakers were in general but i wasn't that up on them okay so y'all here's some issues these are the shakers so the shakers are technically called the united society of believers in christ's second appearing and they are an offshoot of the quakers it was formed in 1747 and at its height there were 18 different communities it was like a utopia they all they owned things in common there is only one community left it's in maine and um at its height there were maybe five thousand shakers and there are only two left two two people two people are shakers who are left and part of that is because the shakers are celibate so they don't get married and they don't have children so that will end your religion fairly quickly um and then they are very they're like a plain hard-working people be- known for beautiful craftsmanship and music and poetry and they're called shakers because when they worship they do these big they do these dances that are shakers so um okay i'm look at that is excited to excess he's still a child is unused to owning things of his own i'm looking at what it says about him very nice oh yeah and would be considered frills thank you that's a reference to the novel good job strudel kitty and then he says pigs are wild things the cow wouldn't run off but would wait for night and then head for a lighted house the orange window of home and hearth and i had to hunt all around i want to find a picture like this picture just seemed like it captured that idea that orange window of home and hearth y'all i need to give you a warning we're going to go over time tonight so if you need to leave it at um, the hour go ahead and I it won't hurt my feelings but um, yeah one of the last shakers did die that was number three there's two left so um, we we still have it just a little we have a little ways to go in this so we're gonna go over so if you have to leave it's okay all right um, so this is what I have to say about this book they're not shakers so um, they these guys are not shakers they're living they're married They're married and they are having kids, so that's not Shakers. Now, you were allowed to keep your kids if you joined the Shakers, but there's no evidence of this. Also, there is no book of Shaker. I looked at this. There's been books written about the Shakers, but they don't have their own, like, book of Shaker. Um, I could not find any evidence. I even, like, reached out to an agricultural extension to find out if there's some known thing about not keeping cows and pigs together. And basically what they said is you can as long as you have enough pasture. So I, it turned out that some of the stuff they were talking about with regard to shakers um, was just not quite right. Like later on, um, he says that this, the, this one guy was a shaker, but he was famous for his war exploits, but the shakers are pacifists and refuse to fight. So I don't really understand why the author throws in all this stuff about the religion when they're really not. So that's that was kind of interesting. So what do you think are some possible explanations for those discrepancies? And does it matter? Like, does it matter that Mrs. Van looked it up and found out that the guy is full of it? Does that even matter? Is it does the author owe us to to represent the shakers accurately? All right. So is it a, is it a possibility that the war exploits guy converted? Is it possible that the war exploits guy converted? Interestingly, the Shakers were a little bit reticent to accept com- converts. Um, and there's no record anywhere. Like, I read a full biography of the guy, and he, he is not known as a Shaker, and he was married. Because if it was found in 1847, and they're mostly celibate. No, 1747. 1747, they're mostly celibate. There had to have been a lot of converts. At first, there were like 5,000 people at one time. Yeah, so... That they they definitely do convert. Well, what they did was they adopted children and raised them. Ah, they okay. adopted orphans. That's how they got kids. It's a little bit creepy. Um, so th- the farmer and the shaker, I want to know, which one do you think had the most influence on the character of the dad? Do you think the dad is more influenced by his profession as a farmer or by his religion of shaker? And do you think those two things kind of overlap? Do you think it's possible that the armor that the author grew up as part of a religion that was similar to Shakers, but branched off and became their own religion? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, that's possible. There are a lot of possibilities. I love seeing your possibilities. Faker Shaker. Oh, Strudel Kitty, Faker Shaker. Oh, where? Oh, my word. There we are. Oh, there we are. Cookie Cookie. Somebody needs to keep track of the hashtags and share them with Cookie Cookie. All right, chapter four. 
the corn cratch. This whole chapter is about the corn cratch. So I had to go look it up. What's a corn cratch? A corn cratch is a corn crib, and this is a corn crib. So they come in different styles. This is the style that would have been popular at the time that this was. Um, and so I'm, I'm loving your explanations about why this might happen, which is interesting. Um, and so um, this is what it would look like. And you can see that they have space in them. The corn cratch was designed that you would put the corn in here and you would store it and you would dry it in there. And so this is the thing that they're trying to move. Michael Archer is going to take care of hashtags. Thank you so much. We definitely need um, Faker Shaker. Um, all right. So he says, Solomon can do it if we help. Solomon don't need muscle help. What we're going to give him, boy, is some extra thinking. We're going to let Solomon use a capstan, just a big, great big crank. And it's like physics for the win, because even though they've just got this one animal to move it, because they're going to be able to make a machine, then they can do it. So here's what a capstan looks like. They're usually used on ships to wind ropes. See these ropes around here? Um, this is called a cleat. It's called a cleat. And so they, they push this around and it lets them wind these big, heavy ropes. And so you've probably seen like ponies, um, like at a fair or something done there. So that's what it is that they're doing. And so then they're having the animal walk around and it's letting it pull. And so they, they're, it's essentially like a pulley system. All right. So, and the dad says this, and because I could not read, I knew to listen with a full heart. Oh. That just got me for some reason. That just got me. Did any of you notice that line? Did any of you notice that line? Oh, I just want to read your comments. I just want to read your comments. I have to keep teaching you or you won't have any comments, but I just love reading your comments. All right. And then he says, Rob says, something to do with somebody called Ethan Allen. I guess he was once the captain or the shortstop. And my question is, who conflates baseball and the revolution? So this is Ethan Allen. Ethan Allen demanding the surrender of Fort Ticonderoga. And um, the, during the Revolutionary War. But I just think it's funny that Rob is so into baseball that he thinks that Ethan Allen must be associated with baseball. And that's kind of fun. Oh, yeah. Um, Michael Deb Coatney saying, I love how they've got a bunch of tourists looking people working the capstan. <laughs> I know. It's like, here, come on this tour this ship and we'll make you act like indentured servants. Um, can you have two colons in a sentence? Yes. Yes, you can. Um, so... It would be hard to do it and still have fluidity, but yes, you can, if you're really mean. Um, I, who confuses baseball and the revolution? I just thought that was pretty funny. So, um, and then the teacher says, she says that because we're all Vermonters, we have to be proud of our yesterday just like today. I think it means to be proud to live in Vermont and proud of Ethan Allen, as well as that other fellow she talks on, the one who lives in a white house. Well, she's talking about Calvin Coolidge, who was the president, who was from Vermont. And so I just thought that was kind of funny. Like, I just think it's kind of funny um, that the way he lives in a white house, like just some random white house. Right. And the dad says this. I'm not allowed to vote. I can't read or write. And when a man cannot do those things, people think his head is weak, even when he's proved his back is strong. And I looked it up to verify that this was correct, but the literacy, like being able to read or write, being literate, those tests for voting ended with the Civil Rights Act in 1965. So that's actually not that far. But I have seen my great, great, great grandfather um, on some of his pension papers from the Civil War. He just wrote an X. And what I don't know, he was actually Quebecois. He was from um, Quebec. And he emigrated to the United States in order to fight in the Civil War in, in New York. And I don't know if he signed his ex because he would write his name in French, but that doesn't really make any sense to me. So I think he was illiterate. And he wouldn't have been able to vote, which is interesting. And the, he says... The literacy tests were frequently not requested of white voters. Yeah, so it, and John saying they were, Jonathan says they're frequently not requested of white voters, which is true, but they were sometimes. Yeah, it was a way to prevent poor people from voting. He failed. Yeah, yeah, he would have failed. They were so here's this people. juxtaposition again. I am rich and they are poor. Maybe so, Papa, but it seems to me that what we have most is, is, what we have is most dirt and work. True enough, but it be our dirt, Rob. I just loved that line. This like... 
the, this this contradiction between the rich and the poor, and we see it again. We're going to see it here in a, in another slide. But can you think of something else? So, like the father values the land because it's his, right? Like it's a lot of work, but it's his. Can you think of something special in your life that others might not value, but it's yours, so it's valuable to you? Can you think of anything there? And then we have this this juxtaposition and this contradiction and this tension between your mission and your dreams, which remember when I box mission in, in the beginning, we're seeing this the whole novel. Every man must face his own mission minus pigs. And I be thankful to be in the picture. And that's kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, what time period is this in early 1900s? Like 19, when was, when was Coolidge president? Like 1917, maybe 15, 17 in there. And I love this idea. When he said, I be thankful to be in the picture, it made me think of tapestries and that tapestries are woven and there's like all these pictures. I looked up like the most famous tapestry in the world is the Bayou Tapestry. And I was going to, I was going to show that, but it's so big, it's impossible to capture. But just the idea that everybody is woven in, I just really, really, really like that. Um, and do you think that every person does have a mission? And what happens if they don't play their part? So like if one person doesn't play their part in the mission, is the picture weakened or does it just go on without them? Like, is it true that everyone has a part to play in this great big tapestry? And then he says, with Pinky next to me that night, I guess I must have been the luckiest boy in learning. And I just love that. Like, you don't have to have a lot, but if you just have, if you just have Pinky, if you just have your pig, it's really all you need. So your stuffed animal, Elizabeth saying you have this stuffed animal that you don't, he was president 23 to 29. Okay. Um, any sort of heirloom that holds value for you or your family, but few other people. That's right. I have a broken vase that belonged to my great, great aunt who raised my grandfather. Um, a stuffed animal. Yeah. Interesting. Um, okay. So last chapter, sorry, we're going over tonight, you guys, but it's, it's hard to do five chapters and I had to introduce the novel next time. I'll keep it in time. All right. So that afternoon, Pinky and I went for a walk and that's this whole thing. That's this whole chapter is this walk. And he asked Pinky, did you ever see a flutter wheel? This is a flutter wheel. A flutter wheel is something at the bottom of water and it turns and it, yeah, it turns the water and has like these paddles on it. And that's what he, he makes it. He, and he, he makes a simple one and puts it in the water. And I'm going to share a whale of a word. This whale of a word is not actually in the book, but I feel like it is the, the idea that he's trying to create. Like you see, I have like paint all over my hands because I spray painting today. Um, so bucolic, bucolic means like that lovely, uh, idyllic impression of rural life. Like I, that the most beautiful way that you could look at what rural life is like is called bucolic. And you will often hear it phrased the bucolic ideal. So it's like this romanticized view of what it's like to live in the country that city people have who don't actually live in the country, right? So bucolic is a really good word to know um, because you can use it to describe like Eden-like stuff, right? Where it's just like beautiful. It's the opposite of dystopia. So you have this bucolic ideal in this walk versus carnivores on the walk because we've got the pig and and this boy and his whistle making the flywheel and this frog hopping along. And then we have the, the cautionary tale of the frog and the crow. And it says that the frog got so busy keeping away from Pinky that he made a big misdo. And I like that word too, misdo. But I think that this is actually an interesting point for us that sometimes we get so fixated on one thing that we don't notice big danger coming, right? Big danger. And so then he, then I thought this is so funny about how they're complaining that frogs only have two legs worth eating because the front legs are so small and, um, Oh, uh, Deb Coatney, bucolic person is someone who drank too much and had a sort of reddish plump face. Yeah, that is a different word. Um, but that redness that you see in that plump face from drinking, that is a condition called rosacea. And it is um, very common. They call it Celtic skin disease. It's really common in English, Irish, and Scottish. And it can look like a ton of broken blood vessels, or it can even be like, um, like 
wounds almost and sometimes it's a bulbous nose um yeah okay so these are frog legs i have eaten frog legs have any of you eaten frog legs i thought i would just show you what they look like they're so creepy like they look so human in some ways but except the flippers have you ever eaten frog legs jonathan i don't remember it jonathan's eaten some weird stuff what oh jay sand says she's wearing a shirt with frogs on it did don't eat the legs um all right, and he's looking down at Tanner's farm, and he says, it sure looks prosperous next to ours, and that's a foil. There's two farms, one prosperous, one not, right next to each other. And um, and I, I think, actually, the word I think that I would describe that face, like I know I see you guys in the chat still talking about, the, the word that I would use is florid, F-L-O-R-I-D, florid, that florid complexion. Um, but this is foil that, that these two farms next to each other. And then there we are with our juxtaposition. And Michael, I think you have to admit that there is a lot of juxtaposition in here. All right. So this Robert Rogers guy that he goes on and on and on about. So I had to go look him up. Here he is. This is the only portrait done of him during his life. He was actually pretty interesting. I wanted to compare in the book. In the book, he's a shaker. In real life, no, he's not a shaker. Shakers are pacifists. In real life, or in the book, he's a Vermonter. In real life, no, he was born in Massachusetts and then he lived in Massachusetts. He lived in a couple of other places as well, but he was not from Vermont. He did, um, I mean, he was there fighting and stuff, but he wasn't from there. And then in the book, he's kind of like Chuck Norris and in real life, he was kind of like Chuck Norris. Um, he's pretty crazy. He led a crazy life. He led this group called Rogers Raiders and a bunch of current American military units have him as like their they consider him their like mascot essentially um but he ended up being on the wrong side of the revolutionary war um he if you're an american he fought for the british and he ended up like asking for a commission in the american army from george washington and george washington was like yeah um no i think i'll throw you in jail instead so so crazy if you are interested in learning more about him he is um, explored fairly extensively in this old, very famous movie called Northwest Passage. So if you're interested in learning more about it, then you can do that. And then he says, chores are my mission, not his. So this is Rob talking about like chores are my mission, not my dad's mission. So I would like you to think of a mission that someone close to you has that they sometimes fail to do that upsets you. And what is it about thinking that's her job? that makes it so annoying when they don't do it. So when you know that like you have one mission and someone else has another mission and they don't do their mission and it ends up on you, why is that so annoying? Um, okay, what's up with this calico cat thing? Well, a calico cat is a three colored cat. No lie, you guys, no lie. Today, I went to the nursery, I went to Callaway's nursery to buy some plants and they had a calico cat sitting on the counter and I had to give him a big lecture about calico cats because this is what I learned. They are considered lucky. In German, they are called Glückskatze, which means lucky cat. And I just thought that was the coolest word. Gluck is luck in German and Katze is cat. Oh, well, cats. Katze. Um, so Gluck, Glückskatze, lucky cat. They are actually not a breed. It's just a color pattern. And the color in cats, this is what I learned that's so interesting. So if you have stayed to the end, you win the prize because um, they color in cats is carried on the X chromosome. And so all male cats are only one color because calico cats are three colored, then they are all female, except if a male cat has a syndrome called Klinefelter syndrome is where they have, so normally a female would have two X chromosomes and a male has an X and a Y. In Klinefelter syndrome, the male has two X's and a Y. And that's why they can have multiple colors. But Klinefelter syndrome, which happens like in one in 3,000 cats will have this, and male cats, or one in 3,000 calicos will be a male cat who will have Klinefelter syndrome. And that has other weaknesses, other health problems, and so they often die early. So there are, yes, um, kind of interesting. All right, I love seeing this. Okay, D Deb Coatney, totally true, totally true. When I wrote that question, I was thinking about you and your sister. And I was like, I wonder if Michael's going to say anything about his sister. Um, yes, that's why tortoiseshells are all females too. And some people consider tortoiseshells and calico kind of interchangeable. Um, although usually calico means like the base coat is white. 
Um, so kind of interesting. Yeah, your siblings basically doing none of the chores and you have to do them. It's more resentful. Yeah, there's a one in 3,000 chance that there's a male calico and that calico has Klein filter syndrome. All right, so why throw this little mini lecture in? Like why, why do you think the author is gonna lecture us about calico cats? Like, and if it lived, it would be a female to male calicos die. Why, why do you think that? Is it like to teach us something? Is it to prove something? Is it for some other reason? Did it remind you of Sam? Um, kind of interesting, Ethan, his mom's on it. Def just assigns different chores so she knows she does it, but still you sometimes end up doing it. All right, no matter how many times a barn cut has her kids, it's always a wondrous thing to see. Last line in, this, in the part that we read. And I'm wondering for you guys, this is interesting, right? This is this juxtaposition of something that's special and yet common. Seems like an oxymoron. So I want you to give me something else that is common, but also wondrous. Something else that is common, but also wondrous. All right. And then this is what Serignus has to say about the book so far. So far, I like it, but I want to eat that pig and all his cousins. <laughs> right? Okay. So, so far, so good. Here's what we've got, guys. If you don't have your bookmark for the class, Go ahead and download it at this link here. And next class, April 9th, we're going to read chapters 6 through 10. Going to read chapters 6 through 10. And I bet you that most of you will have read through the end of the book then. So I will stay here for a second on this slide just in case anybody needs to see anything before I end the class. Y'all are amazing. You stayed 15 minutes late. Oh, my goodness. Oh my goodness, that's so crazy. We usually try to do that. Why did he include it? Because cats are awesome. Okay, Clownfall. And all great literature needs a cat. And also because cats are awesome. Okay, um, I see that Clownfall likes cats. And then um, I find myself doing this interesting thought or mini essay. They don't want to edit essays to do that. No eating Pinky. All right, I'll make sure Pinky is safe. Pinky is safe. Um, and then looking ahead. Yeah, Strudel Kitty says not reading ahead. How about you, Mark C? Oh, guess what? There was um, Teacher Loves Books. Do you guys remember Teacher Loves Books? The username Teacher Loves Books? Teacher Loves Books um, was in a live stream I did for parents. Um, and that was so cool because they're in the class. Um, if dragon eats pinky, they can't make them into a stuffed animal <laughs> when they die. Okay. Um, oh, Jay San, that's so sweet. All right, well, bye, Mon Michael Archer, and thank you, Jennifer. Thank you guys for coming. Nay, pink and, nay bink, bacon pinky. What am I missing about that, Jonathan? What is that? Yay, bacon pinky, nay, bacon pinky. Oh, like that pinky is bacon? I suggested, I just asked the question, yay, bacon pinky or nay, bacon Oh, I see. Colfall says, would have stayed 15 hours, so 15 minutes is no problem. That's so cute. That's what pinky's going to end up anyway. Ethan! Ethan. <laughs> All right, you guys, you're wonderful. I cannot wait to see you. Only two weeks this time. So really good. And I will see you in two weeks. And I hope that you have a wonderful weekend wherever you are. Thank you so much for coming to class. You are my favorite people. Bye, peeps.